As the saying goes, the game of golf is a good walk spoiled. Given the nearly 40,000 golf courses currently in use around the world, a great many people would probably beg to differ, but even the most enthusiastic golfer has at one time or another agreed with this sentiment when faced with the greatest of frustrations, the tedious and often futile search for a ball which has landed in the rough. Many solutions have been proposed for this classic course conundrum, such as painting balls with fluorescent or even glow-in-the-dark paint, all of which sadly still require the use of that most unreliable of instruments, the Mark I eyeball. But this is the 21st century. Surely, among all the advanced technologies at our disposal lies an elegant and convenient method of locating a lost golf ball. For example, some have proposed a tiny radio transmitter. But while this is technically feasible, not only would such a device likely be prohibitively expensive, but making a transmitter robust enough to survive the extreme forces of a golf club stroke would be a major engineering challenge. But what about something simpler, using another form of invisible energy? What about a radioactive golf ball, one that can easily be tracked down using an inexpensive Geiger counter? What could go wrong? And on top of that, surely utilizing ionizing radiation would also improve performance, for reasons we guess. So here now is the bizarre story of the radioactive golf balls. Just before we get back to discussing radioactive glowing balls, you know what's also going to be glowing? Your face when you're wearing super comfy socks from today's sponsor, Bombas. Bombas is a company that was founded over a decade ago when its creators learned that the top three items homeless shelters request in donations are socks, underwear, and t-shirts. Not coincidentally, they set out to try to make the world's most comfy these socks, underwear, and t-shirts, and from the start set a policy that with every single purchase, they donate one such item to homeless shelters and other such organizations. To date, over 150 million items donated. As to what makes their products so comfy, Exhibit A, their socks, made from materials like merino wool and extra long staple cotton with built-in arch support and no seams by your toes. Also of note, Bombas offers 100% happiness guarantee, free returns and exchanges for any reason, and when we queried them about, like, for real any reason, they even noted if your dog eats one or the sock-eating vortex of your washing machine makes one disappear, they've got you covered with a replacement, shipping to over 200 countries worldwide. In the end, while Bombas' legal team told me I cannot say Bombas socks will make all your hopes and dreams come true, I'm just saying... Number one, I think we can all agree new comfy socks are amazing. Number two, celebrating the little things in life and helping those in need are two keys to happiness. Number three, happiness is a key and goal to achieving hopes and dreams. Thus, ipso facto, Bombas socks help make all your hopes and dreams come true. QED. Your move, Bombas legal team. In the end, feel good and do good with Bombas, knowing your purchase is doing some real good in the world. New customers also get 20% off your first purchase. Just go to bombas.com forward slash TIFO and use the code TIFO at checkout. Strangely, radioactive golf balls actually predate the development of practical, portable radiation detectors. Though the basic instrument we now know as the Geiger counter was invented in 1908 by German physicist Hans Geiger, it wasn't until 1928 that he and PhD student Walther Mueller perfected the design and not until the 1940s that practical versions became commercially available. Yet in 1910, the Worthington Golf Ball Company of Ohio began marketing the radio golf ball, featuring a core laced with four nanocuries of radioactive radium-226. Six years later, in 1916, Inventor Ellis Miller of the Radium Golf Ball Company of New York City applied for and was later granted U.S. patent 1,260,788 for a golf ball containing, to quote, a radioactive substance or mixture such, for example, as uranium, mineral, or ore, e.g. pitch blend, or the intensely radioactive bodies known as radium, polonium, actinium, mesothorium, and the like. Radio golf balls sold for $1 each, about $21 in today's money, and were widely advertised in various magazines in newspapers as well as in Wanamaker's department store as the ball of mystery that never loses life or shape due to its inherent radioactive properties. Yet given the lack of commercially available radiation detectors, the radium filling was intended not to aid in locating the balls, but rather to improve their performance. As one Wanamaker's ad from the period breathlessly claims, golfers need not be alarmed. You won't need to lengthen your links because the radio ball carries so far. 
A writer from the New York Tribune suggests that if we keep lengthening the distance of radio golf balls, it will be necessary to lengthen golf courses, and he suggests that golf balls be standardized. We can lengthen the distance of the radio ball, but we won't. It would make the ball too expensive. It isn't necessary anyhow. It is already the most talked of golf ball. Every player who has used the radio has been thrilled and mystified by its extraordinary length from the tee, and in paradoxical combination with this, its consistent reliability on the green. The same ad features a testimonial from one of the greatest American golfers who conveniently cannot be named because we quote without his consent or knowledge, last summer in the Western Championship, I found myself uncertain in my putting and again in the middle of a game. I tried a ball that had what is known as a radium center. Never have I had a ball that I could hit with the same degree of confidence. There was never a ball that could travel further and even the old gutta, percha ball, could not have been more reliable on the green. Well, as we shall see later, there is some circumstantial evidence that irradiating golf balls can alter their behavior. In the 1920s, the radio golf ball's purported performance was ascribed to various pseudoscientific explanations, such as, when the ball is hit, the radium salts in the plastic center start a wave of momentum which gives a great resiliency. The ball literally is alive and the released energy actually fights to free itself. In reality, however, the radio golf ball was not based on any hard science or rigorous experimentation. Rather, it was one of many products to come out of the early 20th century radium craze kicked off by Polish-French physicist Marie Curie's discovery of the radioactive element radium in 1898. Believing that this mysterious, invisible energy source had miraculous healing powers, unscrupulous entrepreneurs inserted radium into all manner of consumer products. Some applications were legitimately useful, for example, Madame Curie herself pioneered the use of radium for irradiating and treating various cancers. Radium was also mixed with phosphors like zinc sulfide and produce self-luminous paint for clocks, watches, aircraft instruments, compasses, and other devices. Others, however, were far more dubious and often downright dangerous, with radium, uranium, thorium, and other radioactive elements finding their way into products as diverse as spark plugs, cosmetics, clothing, emanators for irradiating drinking water, condoms, quack medicines like pills and health tonics, and of course, golf balls. Some of these products thankfully contain no radioactive material at all, the radium branding being mere Really a marketing gimmick similar to today branding everything targeted at men as tactical and anything in the software space is AI powered, while others contained enough radium or other elements to be deadly. Fast forward to the 1950s and the dawn of the atomic age, with portable radiation detectors newly available on the consumer market, it wasn't long before someone applied this technology to the game of golf. In 1950, American nuclear physicist William Davidson, working at the B.F. Goodrich Research Center in Brecksville, Ohio, introduced what he called the answer to the Duffer's Prayer, golf balls containing tiny pellets of radioactive cobalt-60. In June of that year, Davidson invited various well-known golfers, including Denny Shute, Jimmy Thompson, and Lawson Little to try out his invention at the Portage Country Club in Akron, According to a March 1951 article in Mechanics Illustrated, the radioactive balls were a stunning success. The caddies Gaia counters unerringly detected the hiding places of balls driven deep into the jungle. In a classic case of 1950s being 1950s, the same article also features a photo of the bow-tied and bespectacled Davidson demonstrating the balls to a group of women with the line, giving the fairer sex a chance to marvel at modern science. No doubt they were extremely impressed by his radioactive balls. But while B.F. Goodrich chose not to pursue a line of radioactive golf balls, this did not stop others from taking a crack at the idea. As Time Magazine reported in an August the 15th, 1955 article, in one of his gloomier moments, poet T.S. Eliot predicted that Western civilization's sole enduring monuments would be the asphalt road and a thousand lost golf balls. Not if Bart Laper of Gatlinburg, Tennessee has his way. Laper, a drum beater for the local chamber of commerce, needed a gimmick to promote the opening of Gatlinburg's new Pigeon Forge golf course and hit on a surefire teaser atomic golf balls. At nearby Oak Ridge, he persuaded scientists to inject three golf balls with pellets of radioactive cobalt-60, happily headed home to Gatlinburg with his fixings. On opening day last week, as Miss Gatlinburg of 1955 posed prettily on her first tee, a blindfolded caddy toting a borrowed Geiger counter demonstrated that a radioactive golf ball could be found no matter how deep the grass or how dense the bushes off the fairway. However, this seemingly simple and elegant solution to one of golf's oldest problems ultimately failed to catch on for a variety of reasons. 
For example, at the time nearly all radioactive material was regulated by the Atomic Energy Commission, or AEC, today the Department of Energy, meaning any company wanting to manufacture radioactive golf balls would have had to obtain an AEC license to acquire and use the required cobalt-60. And even then, the golf balls would have cost up to $35 each, or about $350 in today's money, making them, in the words of Time magazine, too expensive for any but the best-heeled wastelanders. There was also the problem that then, as now, few ordinary people own Geiger counters, and while lower-end models could be purchased for around $25, these were not very sensitive, while higher-end models could cost up to $700, more than $7,000 in today's money. Even then, the maximum detection range that could practically be achieved was only 1.5 meters, or 5 feet, well within easy visual range. The key limitation was the penetrating power of the three most common types of radiation. Some radioisotopes, like uranium and thorium, decay via alpha emission, releasing an alpha particle comprising two protons and two neutrons. However, Alpha particles have very low penetrating power and can be blocked by just a few centimeters of air, making them unsuitable for long-range detection. Furthermore, Geiger counter detector tubes must be fitted with a special thin mica window to even allow alpha particles to enter and be detected. Other radioisotopes, like cobalt-60, decay via beta emission, releasing a beta particle or electron. These are more penetrating than alpha particles, but are still mostly filtered out after just a few meters travel through air. Cobalt-60 also emits significant amounts of gamma rays, electromagnetic waves with frequencies above 30 exahertz or wavelengths under 10 picometers, and that apparently can also help you hulk out. These are most penetrating of all, only capable of being blocked by thick lead, steel, or concrete shielding. This would seem to make this isotope perfect for long-range detection. However, to be detected at ranges over 1.5 meters, a golf ball would have to contain a truly dangerous amount of cobalt-60. Indeed, the specific activity of this isotope is 1.1 kilocuries per gram, with 1 gram delivering a dose rate of around 15 sieverts per hour at a distance of 1 meter from the source, enough to deliver a lethal dose within just a few minutes. Indeed, early reports on radioactive golf balls, which contain only around 1 microgram or 1 millicurie of cobalt-60, warn golf to not carry them in their pockets for more than three hours per week to avoid excessively irradiating their own balls. But while remotely locatable radioactive golf balls never caught on, this was far from the last time the seemingly unrelated fields of golf and nuclear physics would intersect. For example, in the early 1960s, a firm, Oak Ridge Atom Industries of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, began selling so-called energized golf balls, which, according to company advertisements, are treated with a special gamma energizing process that guarantees over 95% compression. No other USA-made ball does that. The energized steel center gives it greater distance and professional quality, the tough cover longer wear, gives an all-around livelier performance, and it putts well too. Oak Ridge Atom Industries was founded by one Clarence J. Sp Bees, who at some point in the mid-1950s encountered difficulty getting grass to grow on a hillside on his property. He thus sought out the advice of Dr. Marshall Brucer, head of the medical division of the Oak Ridge Institute of Nuclear Studies. During the Second World War, this had been a key site for the Manhattan Project, producing all the enriched uranium used in the construction of the Little Boy atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Dr. Bruce suggested that he expose seeds to gamma radiation, inducing genetic mutations and hopefully producing a hardier strain of grass. This advice inspired Spies, along with Dr. Ralph T. Overman, to found one of the first commercial gamma irradiation services in the United States, headquartered on a 300-acre farm in Patchwood near Oak Ridge. Officially incorporated in 1960, Oak Ridge Atom Industries operated a 10 Curie Cobalt-60 source housed in a 360-kilogram or 800-pound lead shield, which they used to irradiate various products such as atom-blasted seeds for various plants and energized potting soil. And in 1964, the company introduced its most famous product, the Energized Golf Ball, which sold for $2.25 a piece, around $23 in today's money. But these balls only remained on the market for around four years, after which they moved to new headquarters in Louisville, Kentucky, and focused on the irradiation of blueberries and other fruits. However, the company struggled to stay afloat and filed for bankruptcy in 1972. Who could have seen that coming? The next organization to take a swing at irradiated golf balls was Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, or AECL, the crown corporation responsible for nuclear research in Canada. 
In the mid-1990s, AECL's White Shell Laboratories in Pinawa, Manitoba began selling golf balls irradiated with around 300 kilorads of electrons in the laboratory's 10 million volt impella particle accelerator. Conceived as a publicity stunt to promote AECL's research and demonstrate the safety of food irradiation, the balls were handed out as souvenirs at the 1995 G7 summit in Halifax, Nova Scotia. White Shell Laboratories also operated a service whereby, for only $30, anyone in the world could mail a dozen golf balls in for irradiation in the Impella Accelerator. According to AECL spokesman Larry Shuchuk, at its height, this service irradiated up to 7,000 golf balls a year for clients as far afield as Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, and the Middle East. Around the same time, MDS Nordion, a private company headquartered in Ottawa, Ontario, ran a similar promotion with golf balls irradiated with gamma rays from a Cobalt 60 source. But while the packaging for these balls claimed that they could be hit 10% farther than their non-irradiated brethren, as Shuchuk also explained, we make no claims it will work, that would take study, and we don't intend to study it. Instead, AECL staged a non-scientific demonstration in Saskatchewan for a number of pro and amateur golfers, including beloved Canadian newscaster Peter Mansbridge. Given 12 regular and 12 irradiated balls in a blind test, the participants consistently reported the irradiated balls perform better, with Mansbridge claiming it went 240 to 250 yards, which is about 10% farther than I normally get. However, it doesn't help me putt any better or stop me from slicing. Other golfers were more skeptical, for example, Pat Blythe, an employee and avid golfer at the White Shell Laboratory's public information office, stated that they didn't seem to help me, I just hit it in the water or the woods. I leave mine in the bag now, I guess I swing too hard trying to hit it a long ways. While Toshi Yanahara, a member of the culture and informational branch of Japanese Embassy in Ottawa, reported that I used them twice and I didn't find any difference. But even if the effectiveness of irradiated golf balls has never been scientifically demonstrated, is it possible that the technique actually works? Well, yes, actually, theoretically. As this patent filed by Spalding Sports explains, the golf balls of the present invention preferably are cross-linked by irradiation and more preferably by light rays such as gamma rays or UV radiation. Furthermore, other forms of particle irradiation, including electron beam, also can be used. Gamma radiation is preferred as golf balls or game balls can be irradiated in bulk. Gamma penetrates very deep, but also increases cross-linking of the inner core, and the compression of the core has to be adjusted to allow for the increase in hardness. Electron beam techniques are faster, but cannot be used for treating in bulk as the electron beam does not penetrate very deep. The type of irradiation to be used will depend in part upon the underlying layers. For example, certain types of irradiation may degrade windings in a wound golf ball. On the other hand, balls with a solid core would not be subject to the same concerns. Generally, a wide range of dosage levels may be used. For example, total dosages of up to 12.5 or even 15 megarads may be employed. Preferably, radiation delivery levels are controlled so that the game ball is not heated above 80 degrees Celsius or 176 degrees Fahrenheit while being cross-linked. But even if the technique does work, unfortunately irradiated golf balls are no longer produced and original examples from the 1960s and 1990s are now rare and expensive collector's items. And going back to our original problem of finding lost golf balls at long distances, this has actually been solved using much safer, non-nuclear technology. Several companies, including Titleist, RF Golf, and Top Golf, either sell or make extensive use of golf balls with embedded RFID chips. The same technology used in anti-theft tags in stores, these receive radio signals from a handheld transmitter and transmit them back. They thus require no internal power source, with all the radio energy being supplied by the external transmitter. This would theoretically make for an elegant, robust, and inexpensive solution to this most first world of first world problems. So why then do such balls not line the shelves of most pro shops? Well, one reason is surprisingly cost. Despite the inherent simplicity of the technology, RFID golf balls still cost on average $10 to $12 each and the proprietary radio transmitter receivers upwards of $200, making them little more than extravagant gadgets for particularly well-heeled golfers. There is also the fact that U.S. Golf Association, or USGA, rules prohibit the use of golf balls containing data collecting devices in official tournaments. But perhaps the main reason trackable golf balls have failed to catch on is the simplest and most insidious, profit. 
Nearly half of all golf balls sold are ultimately lost, driving huge sale volumes for golf ball manufacturers. Indeed, this is one of the major reasons why B.F. Goodrich chose not to pursue radioactive golf balls in the 1950s. That and, you know, the threat of reducing the world's population of golfers by irradiating their parents' gonads. And in any case, there is, of course, a far simpler and cheaper way of keeping track of your golf balls. Just keep them on the fairway, dude. <laughs>